occasionally uh, people use different words to describe the same thing, and, and I may not even use words the same way that, that Jim Blinn does. So. So I'll just define my own words. Um, all right, the, the topic for today, first of all, is the rendering of polygons, uh, followed by the, uh, uh, the hidden service algorithm, or and I, uh, the hidden service algorithms, as all the techniques behind that. Um, OK, we'll make sure I get this chart right here. All right, there's Z going out here. We've got a three-dimensional object, which is a cube, sitting out in space. Uh, we define all of our objects in this space, so this is called the object space. All right, next we go through a perspective transformation. into um, image space. Now, just so that we're all clear on this, image space, at least as I use it and as frequently used, is also three-dimensional. All right, now that's, that's the point we don't want to get people confused on. The object space and the image space are both three-dimensional. When you go through the perspective transformation and the homogeneous divide, you are still in a three space. You've got three dimensional objects. They're very strange looking. Uh, that is, if you look at them from an, an angle um, that, that it was not intended to look at. In this space, in the xy plane, here's y and here's x, we have got uh, what we'll call the screen. And if we do an orthogonal projection of this object out here onto the screen, we'll see that cube as you would see it in perspective. And that's the whole point of the perspective transformation, is to take it in, into this space and put it into a space into which you can do orthogonal project, projections, because orthogonal projections are much easier to work with. <coughs> Yes. Yes. OK. All right, thanks. 36. Um, <clears throat> OK, so we've got this orthogonal projection. And this is, right here, the, the projected image. We'll call this a screen, and we'll divide the screen up into little tiny squares. Each one of these is a uh, raster element. Well, the other thing, we'll call this the whole thing the raster. Now, because of the isomorphic transformation between this and some of our display devices, we'll sometimes jump back and forth, but I think you'll get the idea. This is a raster element, uh, also called a pixel. Pixel comes from a uh, picture element. Uh, Razzle never caught on. <laughs> That's what it is, a ra raster element. In the center of each one of these, one per pixel, we got this thing, which we'll call a sample point, where we sample the image, if that's how we're making the picture. <clears throat> from this. We take the intensity values at each one of these pixels, and now we put into, we don't have to do this now, but this is just for defining terms, into uh, the frame buffer. Where there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements here and that pixel on the screen. And from these, we go to the raster display. If we go across this line of pixels here, we call that a scan line. And to go in this order, that is starting at the top, 
Like this. It's called scan line order. Horizontal scan line order. Uh, there are times when it makes a difference between horizontal and vertical. Not very often. Most things are built around horizontal scan line order. <clears throat> now, we don't want to get confused on this because there are times when we want to do the calculations in this space and sometimes in this space. To give an example, if you've got um, uh, normals to this surface, then uh, uh, and there are lots of normals, and you transform it into this space, well, those normals are no longer normal to the surface because the perspective transformation, while it does uh, uh, maintain uh, planes, that is, planes transform into planes, lines transform into, pl into lines, angles are not preserved as they go through. And since normals, of course, uh, have got an angle built into them, they're not normal when you get through. All sorts of bad things happen uh, relative to the surface, and they are quite distorted. You can't go into this surface now and recompute the normal. Excuse me, you, you could recompute the normal, but that normal would not be useful for shading. All right, and for that reason, you make a distinction between the two. And there are algorithms where when they figure something out here, like what is going to appear in this pixel, they have to refer back to the original data structure in some form, or they have to take something, uh, is what happens, they have to carry something with the object that is not transformed, which they can, which they can then be used for the uh, shading. Any questions on that? Okay. The, uh, the first issue, then, is how do we uh, take a polygon and render it? Now, we will later, or at a later time, talk about other surfaces besides uh, polygons. Uh, polygons are picked because, in some sense, they're the easiest. There are other senses, though, in which they are not easy. Uh, a polygon, in general, is not a mathematically well-defined object or surface. You know, that's a polygon. Uh, and, and, to, and not only that, it may come out in space. Right? And if you have a, a, a database with objects defined in it, uh, and you have generated them automatically, then there are cases in which you can get these distorted sort of polygons. Well, that's an issue of another time. Uh, but the point is, I don't want you to understand that while polygons are easy in some sense, in other senses, they're very difficult because of their their uh, strange behavior. Okay, the uh, the notion now is we've got this uh, polygon. All right. A polygon is just a list of vertices. So if you have got a program, and later on you'll be putting together algorithms for, uh, uh, for making pictures, uh, and you've got to build up a database, well, that database is going to have a some sort of We'll have a list of polygons, and at the first of the polygon, there is a polygon header. Uh, the polygon header will indicate how many vertices there are in the polygon. And typically, there is a first polygon, and uh, and then you go to this one and this one. All right, and so the the connection is implied, and you'd only define four. You wouldn't have to to make the closure yourself. It's it's implied. There may be reasons why you would want to have a fifth one. It's, it's really up to you and the way that you're implementing a particular algorithm. Uh, now, we've got this list of, of vertices which follow the header. Uh, each vertex has got information like the X and the Y and the Z. And it may also have the normal, so there's the XN, the YN, the ZN. And it might have color R, G, B. It might have transparency. Um, it could have, uh, if, if you're doing a mapping of a texture, it might have U and V coordinates. There are lots of things that you might put with that coordinate. <clears throat> the more sophisticated your pictures, the more that you're going to have. All right, to put that one polygon on the screen, though, let's assume that we've done the transformation, we've projected on the screen, so we have overlaying this polygon the raster. Now, for today, we're going to just talk about point sampling. 
where what we want to do is ask at some point in each pixel whether or not the polygon covers that point. Now, we're doing this for uh, reasons of explaining to you how the algorithms work. Uh, by the end of the course, you'll have to be beyond that, because to do it this way with point sampling is wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, now, it turns out early on in computer graphics, like this is true when I first got to Utah, uh, where Gary Watkins had just finished implementing his hidden service algorithm. And uh, uh, at that time, the theory was explained to us that, that uh, these algorithms work because you, you take an element of the picture that's so small uh, that you can't really see a particular element, and you work at that resolution with point sampling. And because it's so small, you won't see uh, anything funny that's happening. All right. And that notion allowed them to continue on with the development of these algorithms. They didn't know at the time that, they were, that that was absolutely wrong. It doesn't matter if you can't see what happens at a pixel. You can still see all sorts of bad things happen if you point sample. If they knew that, they may have gotten discouraged and, uh, and have stopped work. Uh, so in some ways, it was OK. Uh, unfortunately, there are people still designing algorithms who are discovering the same thing 10 years later. All right, how do we, we render this? Well, we've got this, this polygon. We could do the following. We could start at each pixel, and we could ask whether or not the pixel was inside the polygon. You just go through all the pixels, and then it would get turned on wherever it, it was inside. Uh, obviously, that would not be a, a fast method. Uh, it would require, I mean, you would do something clever, of course. You, you would have a, you set up a min-max box around the polygon, and you would only check the, the, the pixels that it, it could possibly overlap. Now, how would you determine whether or not the thing was inside? Well, <clears throat> one way to determine if it's inside is uh, as you go across, you count the edges. So if you've got a polygon that looks like this, uh, if you cross odd edges, you're in. Even, you're out. Odd, you're in. All right? Now, that You've got to make some assumptions. Now, that's why polygons are so ugly. Um, that whole scheme falls apart when you've got things that are twisted around and, and crossing each other. Um, now, pretty apparently, that'd be pretty slow. Right? There's, there's a second method for the determining whether or not you're inside the polygon. Uh, and that is, uh, rather than count, you, uh, you make some test for, for in and outness. And that is, uh, you, you take the angle subtended, um, and this angle, and this angle, and you sum up each of these angles. And if you are inside the polygon, the angles will sum to 2 pi or minus 2 pi. And if you are outside, they will sum to 0. And I don't remember what happens on an edge but you're close enough. Uh, and in fact, you can do that. That will work if you only have two bits of accuracy. So you don't need a lot of data to check that out. Now, these, uh, these techniques may be useful for some algorithms. And obviously, we would, I think you would easily discover that, that there are times when uh, th this particular algorithm would not be appropriate for rendering a polygon. But there are times when a particular technique is useful to know, because you just want to know if some point is in some large polygon. Uh, another tool along the same line is that of uh, the, uh, the distance equation. Um, I don't know if this was covered last week or not, but, but you should all know that the e equation of a line is um, okay, ax plus b equals c. And for the plane, it's ax plus by plus uh, CZ plus D equals zero. It's con consistent. Am I missing something here? Uh, I always get confused with this stuff. Now, the thing is, if you've got this line here, and you have, uh, and you got some point, if you just plug the point into the line, then if you're on the line, it's zero. If you're on one side, it's 
negative and the other side is positive. Which brings us to the next thing. <clears throat> there is a convention which you should adhere to that you always define your polygons, the orientation, to be the same looking at the outside of an object. As if you've got a cube, you may choose it so that looking from the outside you're going clockwise. Then every polygon from the outside should be clockwise. Or some very complicated object should be defined so that looking at it from the outside gives you a, a, a clockwise orientation. Now the result of doing this is that you can then be consistent about whether or not something is inside or outside as you apply this distance measure. It also allows you to throw or, or play other tricks where uh, the normals, you're going to use some algorithm for de de defining the normals. The normals will all point the same way, either outside or, or inside. You wouldn't want them, uh, for lots of reasons, to be arbitrarily pointing in or out. Uh, especially when it comes to shading. You get some very strange artifacts on the surface. All right, so uh, the next step, of course, is to uh, is figure out a better way of doing this. <clears throat> One of them is to sort these, these uh, vertices based on, let's say, the y value. Uh, obviously, the y value, because we're going to go and and scan line order, which means we're going to take this whole scan line and this whole scan line. <coughs> if, we start, if we sort these things, we get these two lines first. Now we take those two lines, um, start at the, uh, figure out which one is, is going this way and which one going this way, or which one's first, and then set up a difference equation for where they start on the line. And as we go from scan line to scan line, the only thing we have to do is update an increment to this line. We've got the same object here. Now, once we've got this left value and this right value, we can just step right along here and, and fill in that little polygon. Move on to the next scan line, fill in this guy. Move on to the next one. Well, as we move on to the next, we notice that we have lost one edge. We look in our sort list, and we see that a new one has come in place it in the list, and continue. Go to the next scan line, we've brought in another one, and now we finish out on these, and when all the polygons, or when all the vertices are gone, we're done with the polygon. All right? Yes, go ahead. I don't entirely see what you mean by short. You mean you just figure out on any particular horizontal or vertical line where the polygon begins and ends? I didn't understand the first part of the question. I don't, underst I don't understand what the short. I've never heard that expression before. The short? To short something. Sort. Oh, sort. 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 I'm sorry. Oh. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> okay. It's the echo. All right. <coughs> I have to stick my tongue out farther. All right. It's all straightforward now. It should be fairly easy. <coughs> Uh, if you're making a picture, you may be making pictures of thousands of polygons, so whatever you're doing, you need to do very quickly. Uh, and therefore, you, you probably want to play games to make that as, as fast as possible. Uh, one other thing I should mention, too, that once you have established this line here and you're doing a linear interpolation, then not only do you linearly interpolate the, the, uh, the x value here, but you may also interpolate other components, like the color, the intensity, um, you know, and so forth, through the list that's here. Uh, and we'll talk more about shading later, so we'll just set that to the side now. Just for you to be aware that there are several things that can be interpreted, interpolated, as well as you can now take these same values and interpolate along the scan line. Yes? Have you uh, said whether pixels are going to be the center of the coordinates or at the, or at the uh, corners of them? Well, um, as, as you're first working with this, you can pick them where it's convenient for you. Because, in fact, uh, the last thing you have done anyway is to do a transformation. You can always transform the whole thing half a pixel up and down, depending upon what your needs are. Uh, so that's not really a problem. All right, It's just where it's most convenient for you. 
by the, well, as we advance into this, we will want to go beyond uh, point sampling anyway, where it will make a difference where the thing is positioned. All right, one other uh, item before we jump into uh, the hidden surface algorithm, um, and that's the, uh, the notion of polygon clipping. Uh, I don't know how much you got into polygon clipping, but it is a, and I know Nelson said he covered that some last quarter, but I'm just briefly going to go over it just as a review because it's a very, very important notion in hidden service algorithms. Now, polygon clipping and clipping in general was presented to you probably uh, for the purpose of clipping off against the edge of the screen or against the edge of the, of the image space. Uh, in, in fact, there are, are additional uses beyond that in conjunction with hidden service algorithms that make it worth repeating uh, beyond the obvious need to, to clip against the edge of the screen. The notion is that we have got some plane and uh, there is some other polygon. I shouldn't draw it this way. All right. No, I'm not doing this all right. Okay. Y'all see that? Uh, this polygon intersects the big flat one here. And, and what we want is the general method for determining uh, how we cut this other polygon into pieces. Uh, so let us look at this with a side view. Here's a polygon. Remember, this is defined as a list of vertices going like this. This is our plane, which is AX plus BY plus CZ plus D equals zero. Uh, if this is the first point. Then we'll take that first point. We'll just plug it into that equation, and it will, unless it's on the plane, it will be either less than or greater than zero. Uh, and that will decide whether the thing is in or out. And you presumably will, ahead of time, have determined whether the positive or the negative side is in or out. Now, we are not going to clip away one of these. What we're going to do is to clip this polygon into two polygons. Not three, mind you. Into two polygons. And we're not really saying necessarily one is in or out. It's just that one is on the... A side and one is on the B side because, in fact, we may want both of the polygons. So we start with the first one. We go to the next vertex and again ask the question, is it in or out? Well, in this case, excuse me, is it A side or B side? Well, this is on the B side. The previous point was on the A side. So whenever we have crossed, if you cross, you calculate the new vertex. So we're going to build two lists, the A list and the B list. And this is vertex one, uh, two, three, four, five, six. And we're going to call this uh, intersection here seven, this intersection eight, nine, ten. I'm just labeling them now. You don't know what they are ahead of time. Point one. Uh, we determine it's on the A side, so we write it on the A side. We go to the next vertex, it crosses, therefore we calculate the intersection and put it on both sides. Excuse me, that's a one here. Then, on the B side, we copy the two. We go to the next vertex, and again we have crossed, we calculate the intersection, label it eight, write eight on both sides, and write three on the A side. Go to four, again we cross, calculate the intersection, write four on this side. Go to the next point, point five is on the same side, which is the B side, so we just copy it. Go to the next one, which is six, 
uh, we've, we've uh, crossed. So we write the 10, the 6. Then we go back to the first point, and it's on the same side. Uh, we just have to make the check in case there was an intersection, but uh, we've already got the point down there. All right, now notice what we've got here. If we follow this, is we've got a point 1, 7, 8, 3, 9, 10, 6. That's one polygon. The second one is 7, 2, 8, 9, 4, 5, 10, and then it goes back up here to 7. All right, so this, these two pieces here are, in fact, part of one polygon. And we have now split, well, in, in fact, if we're doing a whole bunch of polygons against this plane, we have split the world of polygons into two different planes. And now we may want to deal with each one. If it turns out it's clipping for viewing, then typically you throw one of them away. But you don't always do this for, uh, for viewing. Any questions on that? Okay, let's move on to uh, um, hidden surface algorithms. Um, first, a little history. When uh, people first got the notion that they might use the computers to make pictures, um, it was not really practical at that time to think about raster pictures. But they did think about line drawing pictures. And there were some early systems where they could drive the lines on uh, oscilloscopes with the computer. Uh, and there were some people early on who thought about the problem. Um, they're mentioned in the book, Appel and Roberts. You've got a list of polygons. Now what you want to do is determine which of these should be visible. And that is the whole problem with, the biggest problem with computer graphics and the long running battle of What's the best way to get rid of the things that you can't see? Uh, and this, that, that issue of, of hidden surfaces or visible surfaces, depending on who says it, uh, took about a 10-year period to get to the point where people pretty well understood it. Uh, it is still not easy. It is very difficult to implement a good hidden surface algorithm. There are a fair number of them out, though, and, and most of them I've got weaknesses with them. So it's not the kind of thing where you understand it and now it's easy. It's the sort of thing where you understand it, but it's still hard. Uh, and the unfortunate consequences are that there are lots of people who then can't latch into it and, and find out that it's easy. They have to go through and rediscover a lot of the old, uh, a lot of the existing techniques. Um, in any case, uh, the notion is what is in front. Um, the first uh, programs that were written took a polygon and in essence compared it against the remaining polygons to determine whether or not it was in front. And they had some rather baroque and interesting ways uh, also some useful techniques for determining if this polygon was in front of, the, uh, in front of this one. If they were connected in polyhedra how do you take advantage of that connection so that you can solve the problem uh, more easily. And uh, they made pictures of, uh, of simple things like boxes and uh, maybe a simple architectural model. Uh, nothing extremely complicated. Uh, I don't know how, how complicated the things they did try. The computers were not as fast then. Uh, and there was difficulty with generating the data. In general, things were a little more primitive. Um, the first or the biggest problem with all this is that if you compare a polygon against all the other polygons, then uh, it's going to take a long time to calculate the, uh, the whole picture. Uh, for instance, if you have got n polygons, then you grab the first polygon and compare it against all the rest, you've got n minus 1. And then you grab the next polygon and compare it against those that remain, and you've got n minus 2, and so forth. And and uh, as most of you know, that is an n-squared process. Uh, now, <clears throat> n-squared uh, gets completely out of hand when you've got 100,000 polygons. 
and, uh, and of course in those times it was not conceivable to have 100,000 polygons, whereas uh, nowadays it is. Uh, but it would not be conceivable if, if we had n squared algorithms. Then uh, uh, some people at General Electric, uh, Bob Shoemaker being one of them, uh, who currently is at Evans and Sutherland, and some other engineers came up with a priority scheme where they, uh, in a rather clever scheme, assign a priority to each of the uh, uh, polygons and therefore could discard, discard ones of lower priority. So they had a world that was made up of uh, convex objects. Um, and it turns out that you can assign the priority to each one of these faces. Uh, in this case, in a cube, would, they'd all be one. Um, then the other thing you can do is you can throw away all back-facing polygons. Remember, I said these are convex. If they're convex, then if the normal point's away from you, then you can't see it. All right, so you throw it away, then all these things are priority one, and you can see them. That's fine. Suppose we had an object that was shaped like uh, this. Then uh, I believe if you give this a priority of one, 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 and I think these are two, two, like so. Now, you throw away, you're looking at, at some angle like this. You throw away the back-facing polygons, and you automatically throw away this and this and this and this. All right, and we're looking from this point of view. Now, one has higher priority than two, so what the person sees is, is that, and it works. And there are even some automatic schemes. Well, excuse me, this isn't convex. Um, there are some restrictions. I, I, I forget offhand what the restrictions are on the surface. Uh, it's more general than just convex. Um, in any case, there's an automatic scheme for assigning a priority to a polyhedra uh, so the, the person designing it doesn't have to worry about it. And you can try from whatever schemes. It really does work. And then uh, if you've got different objects out here, then th the priority for the whole object is determined by how far away it is. So they're able to group these things. Yes? So is the numbering dependent on the views? Does it have to be recalculated depending where you're looking from? No, no. That, the whole point is it is view independent. I mean, uh, that's, in, in other words, if you did what I said from any view, that would work. In other words, if you're looking at it from this view of where the twos are in front, well, the ones, which are high priority, have all been thrown away. And I think the automatic scheme will even pick out the fact that it won't work for, for some objects. I'm uncertain of that. It's a pretty clever idea, and it's not an obvious thing. They built this in hardware. And so they had, I believe, the first real-time simulator, and they'd handle a certain number of edges, two or four hundred polygons in real time, and they build a little simulator with it. Yes? What's the basis for uh, assigning the priority? What's the algorithm for determining what the priority number? I don't recall. Um, I had it explained to me a long time ago. There's a, there's a matrix, in essence, where you, you take this edge, well, you've got if I thought about it, I might be able to recall it, but you've got every edge here and every edge here. Uh, and now you compare this edge against every one of these edges here, and you determine whether front or back, from, from some general conceptual point of view of, of whether or not this can work. Um, and then when you work at this matrix, you massage it, and if the object cannot be put into the scheme, then the matrix won't massage. All right. It's, it's of that flavor. Yes. So you're not using information on the normals to do this? It seems like at first you said, well, you find out all the ones that are pointing backwards and throw those out, and that would depend on, in your vertex list, you had information on the normals? No, you, know, you do have to do that. In order for the, sch in order for the scheme to work, uh -huh. you must throw away back-facing polygons. So you have to know about the normals. And you said one thing about the order in which you did, you said the perspective transformation dis doesn't preserve the angles. So you have to do this before? 
Right. In other words, yeah, that's right. You have to make sure that you've got the right normals there to make the decision. <clears throat> All right. Um, these guys were, were clever. In fact, they say they were hired away by Evans and Sutherland, and uh, uh, Schumacher is still designing lots of uh, clever hardware uh, for ENS. All right. Another scheme that happened uh, a little later was that of uh, uh, John Warnock. Uh, and a few other people early on at the University of Utah. The University of Utah was, I believe, the first place to be funded in a major sort of way by ARPA for computer graphics. Um, and that started when Dave Evans came. Ivan Sutherland, at that time, was the administrator of ARPA. And uh, <laughs> well, apparently this wasn't the first time it happened, uh, where they would give major funding to something, and then uh, as their term in office is over, they would go to that place. <laughs> um, and I, Larry Roberts, who was the administrator before him, uh, did the same thing. I may be distorting my history a little bit. This is all before my time. So uh, Dave Evans, in fact, Dave Evans, I think, came from Berkeley. At least he was in this neighborhood. Uh, was the chairman of computer science at the University of Utah, and Ivan Sutherland came. And they brought in their first group of people. So there was John Warnock and uh, Gordon Romney and uh, a few other people like that. Uh, and Warnock came up with the following sort of scheme. What have I got here? We have a a screen, and projected onto this are some objects which uh, might even intersect, like so, and there, wherever. <clears throat> now, what he said was, let us take this image and, uh, and ask the question, is this picture trivial enough to just display as is? Some criterion are trivial. It may be that uh, whenever you've got three polygons, they've got a trivial algorithm for it. In his case, the first issue was, uh, was, was I mean, the first implementation didn't have that. It was, you had to have only one polygon visible. Uh, if you couldn't display it, then split the screen up. All right, so we clip each one of these guys against the edge. Again, we see clipping coming into play. And look at each one of these quadrants and ask the same question. Is it trivial to display? So let's say this is our first one here. Well, there's only one polygon. And since he's got a trivial one polygon displayer, he displays this whole quadrant and uh, moves over to the next one. In the next one, we ask the same question. Trivial? No. We split it. And uh, we find this one goes out trivially. This one does. This one. Uh, this one doesn't, so we split it, and now we get rid of these. Has got a lot of games uh, to, to, to make it more efficient. Uh, I mean, the algorithm really does work. But the notion here is, is just the principle. All right, and the principle is that if there's only one polygon on the list, then you can go ahead and display it. All right, you understand that? Pardon? His, his point is that if, if you have a surrounder polygon, then you can have your whole window is already inside a polygon, which is closer to you than the polygon that's within the window. Well, he, um, In which case, you can't display the polygon that you see inside the window because it's behind. All right, let's, let's take, uh, suppose this is our polygon, all right, and, and we've got this window right here, and you're saying that... The, so once we get to here, this one polygon completely covers it. All right, now, there's, there's an important point here now, and that is, it's as if you didn't really believe the polygon clipping works. Um, when we split this guy into four windows, we split this thing into two polygons. This isn't the way John Warnock implemented it, but just, just so you understand this, the principle. You split this into two polygons, so this is your new polygon. Now, we, uh, 
uh, when we went down to this quadrant, we split off this. So this is now a polygon. Now we're up in this quadrant here, and we split it. And when we split there, we went like this, right? And so we clipped off this, which left this polygon, and we clipped against this one, it left that polygon. So that polygon exactly coincides with our little viewport here. There's one polygon in that viewport, for it, and therefore it is visible. Is that better? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. I'm yeah. I'm coming. Coming to that. Um, that happens to be over here. Where uh, let us we're, we're now splitting down, and uh, let's take this case here, where we've got this point. Where within this point we have got two polygons, which are visible. Let me just extend the line down here a bit. This, this is a, there's an intersection here, all right. And th at this point, we've got two polygons. Both of them uh, are the size of the little window we're looking at. We've clipped off. Well, that's a nice easy case. We should uh, we should just solve that one outright, and ask the question: Which of the two is in front? Because it, if it completely surrounds the window, then anything behind it is obscured. And therefore, we just display the one that's in front and throw away the one that's behind. Or if there's more than that, we throw it away. Ah, yes. <clears throat> now I move down to the next one. I don't know if you can see this from where you are down there, but the <laughs> intersection, the intersection, just imagine, it's 512 resolution, all right? Chalk's not small enough. The intersection happens here. So you go on and you, and you keep dividing. And obviously, at the point of intersection itself, you, you just, you could, keep on dividing for a long time. And uh, and this is where, yeah, where John Warnock said, well, when you get down to one pixel, you can't see anything smaller than that. So who cares? <laughs> um, pick the one you think might be the closest, and that's what you display. And that's what point sampling is, really. And you just pick one point and, and decide it. And so you go through the whole picture doing that. In fact, I think there are there are illustrations in the book here showing uh, some pictures where they've got the fine lines of the thing being drawn. And it gets pretty, uh, pretty hairy. Oh, it's like page 380. <clears throat> now, at the time that he did this, there was a flaw in the algorithm. And the flaw was that it required a frame buffer. Well, in those days, they didn't have frame buffers. Um, he did make pictures, though. It requires that you take these things in a certain order, and you still, you still can do it. Uh, and he also tried to be a little bit more general than this. He, he said, well, this is a way of implementing it, but you don't have to split up based on the quadrants. You might split up in any way. The notion is, and this is the important thing in Warnock's algorithm, <coughs> is that given a list of objects, you split it up into something that is smaller and simpler. And you keep on splitting up until it's smaller, uh, into smaller and simpler pieces until you've got something which is simple enough for you to handle with something else. All right? And that's, you all recognize that. That's just a recursive divide and conquer notion. All right. Um, <clears throat> That was the first generation uh, of uh, hidden service algorithm at Utah. Uh, the, uh, th there was also a, a one based on triangles, which I won't go into because it's not, uh, um, I don't need to give you every algorithm that was ever developed. But uh, uh, the next real important one was that of uh, uh, Watkins. Actually, I should mention the first one based on triangles. Uh, and that was one developed by Romney. Another list of people. Uh, it's Romney et al. Um, the thing about it, it was uh, remarkably fast, but it was restricted to triangles only. Now, Watkins, yeah, what's wrong with triangles? Pardon? Yeah, that's that's right. That's what he did. 
Uh, Watkins had a scanline-oriented algorithm. Um, all right, how did it work? Again, we've got the screen, and we have this list of, of polygons. His notion was to, uh, to sort and handle these in such a way that he could actually build a real-time device. Uh, and he did do that. There was a hardware implementation of this algorithm at the University of Utah. ENS then built and sold one to Case Western, where they still have it. Um, and it, with, it, with a great deal of effort, they keep the thing maintained. Um, and they have never built another one. Uh, and I got there just as, as he was building this piece of hardware. Uh, nobody at Utah ever really used it. They always used the software implementation. Um, partly because the hardware implementation didn't have a shader that worked. Uh, and therefore, it wasn't all that much faster. And it was a little flaky. In any case, the, the notion is that we're going to take these polygons and... Uh, Rather than, than represent them as polygons, he said, all right, I just want edges. Just, just give me edges. Er, an edge belongs to a, a polygon, but that'll just be a label that belongs to the edge. What I really got here are nine edges. Or uh, let's, let's even make it more than that. It's uh, 13 edges now. <clears throat> he sorted the edges in the y direction using a y bucket sort. You've got uh, 512 resolution, you've got 512 elements uh, in your bucket. Anybody not know what a bucket sort is? Good. I taught a course at NYIT, which is not a very good school, and there nobody knew what a bucket sort was. All right. Okay, so we've got this bucket sort, and we just sort these edges. So um, here's our Y bucket, and uh, there's a zero if there's nothing there, and otherwise there's a pointer to an edge, and all these edges that happen to start at the same place, in which case there may be four here, are all linked together. So now we have a list of these edges as they come in. <coughs> when the edge comes in, we put it well, excuse me, these are all out on a file somewhere in sorted order. Now we bring them in one at a time. We bring in this edge, and we're now going to stick it into an edge, or into another list, which is sorted on the X value. So we would bring in each of these guys, and we'd have a list called the active list. And the active list has got a pointer to all of the edges which cross the current scan line. So as we get down to here, for instance, we're going to have this edge, this edge, all in the active list. OK, got that? So that's this sort of list. And these are sorted in X order. All right, once we're down this scan line, we go th through the sorted X order, and so we've got the, the X left one right there. Um, and now we want to build up a span of what's covered. Well, in this case, there isn't anything else there, so it's pretty easy. Um, let's move down a little so we're not just dealing at points. We've got this edge and this edge. Well, they belong to the same polygon because we checked the little identifier. Uh, and therefore, we, we say that's a segment, which we will then display. A nice big blank hole. This is our next segment. Now, we, each time we move on to the next scan line, we take this edge and we increment its x value. All right? So we've got a new x value. So we've gone, we go through the whole list here each time and we update the x value. And when we do that, we check to make sure that it, it, it maintains its correct sort. In other words, if we have. Uh, Let's suppose we're down this far. This is one scan line, and this is the next scan line. As a result of updating X, we find that they've switched in the X sorted list. So 
so as we as we make this one list between scan lines, uh, well, in fact, there's an order. The order is you bring in the new scan lines, you, you zip them in the right place, you update all the X's, and then uh, you check to make sure that they're really in the correct order as a result of the update. So now we're down here. When we get down to this point, uh, we we run across and we pick out what this guy is. We find out who's in between, and now we've got to make some decision as to who's in front. And in fact, he does some subdividing here. If this polygon is not clearly in front of the guy that's behind it, then he will split things in two to finally find out where they may intersect, for instance, or until he can fully resolve which is in front. All right, and essentially that's what the algorithm is. And as I say, he built all of this in, in hardware. Uh, the reason they don't build that anymore is that, if, uh, you know, as, as computer science developed and hardware developed, what they really do are build special purpose processors and microcode them and, and implement the algorithms that they have. All right, and that's, that's Watkins' algorithm. At the same time, at the uh, University of Illinois, I think, there were a couple other guys who had a a similar algorithm, um, and it uh, it was scanline oriented, same way, broke things up, did things a little bit differently, and they added shadows. I think uh, the the algorithm of Romney's, which I mentioned to you, which only worked on triangles, uh, sorted things by triangles and just kept things a little bit different. But basically, it's the same sort of concept. You sort them in Y. And you, then you maintain this X list and just proceed across to determine which is in front, which is in back, doing that as quickly as possible. Any questions on that? Just for the purposes of comparison, can you give some sort of speed calculations, like how many polygons, how fast? Or well, um, you know, I don't, as far as their box went, I, I don't recall the actual number that it would handle uh, in real time. It was probably not more than a thousand or two thousand. It was not a large number. In terms of comparing them um, uh, for their speed, uh, w I would like to defer that uh, until later when we talk about a, a big comparison that was made, an analysis of how all these algorithms work. All right, uh, the next notion, which I'll finish up with on today, was one that came out of England um, by uh, Martin Newell, who was really the driving force behind it, uh, and his brother and a guy named Thomas Sancha. So it's Newell, 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 Newell and Sancha. Um, Martin Newell was subsequently brought to the University of Utah uh, to take over really, because uh, Ivan and, and Dave Evans were involved in the company, and plus one of them was moving out to, to the West Coast, and they needed someone in-house to uh, uh, be the, the local guru. And that became Martin Newell, who is now at Xerox. In any case, uh, the notion with that algorithm is that you sort all of the objects in Z. So uh, uh, the first polygon is the one that's farthest away. And as you come closer, now all you do is you take that last polygon, and, and this time, let's say we've got a frame buffer. At that time, they didn't have a frame buffer, so they went through an elaborate mechanism, which is part of their paper, uh, to, to, well, it, it, it uh, once frame buffers came along, the idea obscured uh, the real notion, and that was that you take the polygon that's farthest away and you render it into the frame buffer. And then you take the next one that's closer and you render it. And the next one up closer and you render it. Well, you might wipe out something that was put down previously. And you just keep building up, and it's called the painter's algorithm, until you've got your final picture. Now, there are a, a couple of problems, as well as a couple of flaws with the approach. 
The problem is that you may not be able to correctly sort the object in Z. For instance, if they intersect, then you can't say that one is in front of the other. So what do you do if they intersect? Well, you clip, of course. Right? You pick, it just doesn't matter which one, you take one of the polygons and then you clip. Now you know that you can order them. All right, let's take another case. Um, I don't quite have enough erasers to do this right. Well, I need three, um, so I'll draw it. Let's see. Right? Now, what is the correct ordering of that? These polygons do not intersect, and they also do not have a correct ordering. Admittedly, it's not the sort of, of object you're likely to have around very often, uh, but it's always fun to think of cases which will blow another person's algorithm out of the water. Uh, but there is a reasonable solution to that. Uh, and at the time, I, 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 I casually say, oh, well, you go off and you clip. Well, at the time, it wasn't that obvious, because the notion of polygon clipping was not well understood at the time. Uh, and so they, they did play some games. But what it came down to, really, is that if you have a case like that, you, uh, you clip. You just you take the plane of this guy, and you clip the other ones against it. I'm not sure what that plane will look like, but this guy gets clipped into two pieces, and you take another one. And, well, when you did that, you might have clipped off this guy, too, um, and so forth. Right, and that's, that's the notion of the thing. You clip. You make it simpler. Then you sort them. So what they did is they sorted in Z. Now, once they sort in Z, um, if you could think of, of hundreds of polygons here, you've got a few for which you cannot correctly define the order. Now, once you've got that situation where you can't correctly define the order that the polygons go in, you've got to go through these more elaborate comparisons. Now, if you have a case like this, and you also have a, a polygon which overlaps in Z but is off to the side, then you wouldn't want to make, you wouldn't want to clip this guy against these. Uh, so obviously, and they did this too, they put a min-max box around the particular polygon that they were considering. Let's say it was this one. All right, there's a pick this polygon here, put a min-max box around it. And trivially, anybody else they couldn't resolve in the z-direction was outside of this, uh, was ignored for the sorting in z because it didn't matter. You only have to resolve these, so they would resolve these guys and it would work. So what they did was took all these polygons and they made a big, long list of them. And let's, let's call this far, and that's near. All right, this particular polygon, uh, in fact, let's look at the image space from the side. So here's the screen. You're looking at the side view of the screen. Here are these polygons inside this space here. Now, if we take this guy here and we take his, his near Z, this is near Z, and this is Farzy. All right, we take the, the, the Farzy and the near Z, and we, we go up the list, and we say, how many polygons have a Farzy which overlaps the near Z? Well, we've got one here that is that way, and so we've got, in essence, two polygons, and uh, we have to, in other words, we have to search up this list to find everybody's Farzy who overlaps the near Z. Now, these guys can't be sorted on both far and near, so let's sort them only on the far. All right, let's take this far. And now we've got to go up here, and we have to look at every single polygon until we find that there is no far Z that is farther away than the near Z. Got that? In this case, we come to the second polygon, we find it. And now we check the min-max box of this guy. We find that he doesn't overlap. Good. We can paint him. 
get him out of the list and take the next guy. Now the next guy we, we pick off, so this guy's gone. We pick as far as the, and now we go up and we find that we've got one, two, three guys who overlap. That's, you know, where we go this far up into the list. And now one at a time we check. And in one case here we find that there is an overlap. Uh, and therefore we have to do something more elaborate. So we can trivially throw away some. We may have to clip or not, but when we finally resolved it, we paint it and continue up the list. All right. Simple algorithm. Uh, there is still a flaw with it, though. Uh, and it had, I'm just, I want to say this now, even though we haven't talked about anti-aliasing. And that is that if we have got this polygon and this polygon sharing an edge. And, and, and this one is painted first. Well, with anti-aliasing, as you paint an edge, to make a smooth boundary at the edge, you're blending it with what the background is. So at the, when you lay down this guy, you do a smooth blend of what this guy is with the background. All right. Now you come in and you do a smooth blend of this guy with the background, which is already a combination of this guy in the background. The result of that second blending is that some small amount of the background is in that seam. But in fact, you shouldn't see anything through there. Got that? All right. So that's the flaw. Now this flaw is going to come up over and over again. For the time they... Uh, uh, no, I think they were aware of that at the time, because I, I recall vaguely something about... No, this is late. I, it's because I knew Martin over many years, I, I get time confused. I, I think at the time they missed that. But later on, he was making suggestions like uh, actually increasing the size of each polygon outwardly by one half a pixel to, to get rid of the problem. Um, I, I don't know anybody successfully who has who done that.